uh, I wanted to start by uh, talking about this. This is, a, uh, this is a cloud pet. More specifically, this is the exact cloud pet that my mother bought for my daughter when she turned five years old for her birthday. Now, the cloud pet, for anybody who's not familiar, is actually kind of a cool idea. Uh, it's connected via Bluetooth uh, to an application that runs on the parent's phone. Uh, and what happens is whoever else has access, so in this case grandma, can record a voice message and can send it over the internet. I see the message coming inbound, I can verify that it's from a trusted sender, and then I can send it along to my daughter so that she can listen to it on the stuffed animal. When it arrives at the stuffed animal, its heart like blinks a nice little red color, uh, and she gets to play it by pressing one of the hands, and she can press the other hand to record her own message and send it back to grandma. It's actually kind of a cool, fun way for uh, people to be able to keep in touch with kids, no matter where they're at. Now immediately, the security advocate in me was very skeptical of this cute looking little unicorn uh, because I've learned that you never trust anything that is connected to the internet in any way, especially things that are like this, where they're a little off kilter, they're not quite the web app, they're something else, some other device. However, when my mom sent the first me message to my daughter, uh, she lit up. She was ecstatic. She was so excited. She played the message. She came running up to me and played the message like 10 times in a row, telling me, oh, grandma was talking to her through the unicorn, which is kind of a weird statement to make, but it's, you know. And so then she would record the message and send it back. And every time she got a new message from grandma, it was the same reaction. She just light up with pure joy. And so the father in me ended up overruling the security advocate in me. Uh, and the cloud pet got to stay in the family. Fast forward a few months, and Krebs Law uh, caught up with it. Uh, Brian Krebs, a big security researcher, talked about how if you connect it to the internet, someone is going to try to hack it, no matter what it is, including cute little stuffed animals. So around February, there was a massive data breach that made news outlets all over the place. Um, basically, millions of different records from the database, including information about the people who had those Cloud Pet accounts, as well as the actual recordings themselves, ended up being exposed and leaked. Now, the reason for this is actually, it's quite terrifying. It's not like some sort of a complex hack or anything like that. It turns out that their database, somebody figured out the IP address where it lived, and it turns out that it was happily accepting remote connections from anywhere else without any authentication whatsoever. Now the reason for this is because it was using an older version of the popular open source database MongoDB. Now older versions of MongoDB did not have this line in their configuration file. This line is what binds the database only to local connections and makes sure that a remote address cannot connect directly to the database. Also, by default, MongoDB does not have authentication in place, which means that if you installed the older version of MongoDB by default without going back and configuring this, you were by default insecure. Now, this violates a concept in software development of, knowing, of being secure by default, the idea being that when we ship a piece of software, when we ship an application, we should have default settings that are secure in place. It's a fantastic idea um, in theory, but more often than not, it's violated and ignored. There's always been this tension, this sort of friction between what's usable and what's secure. The most secure settings are not often not the most usable settings. Uh, and so what happens is often when we ship something, we tend to prioritize that frictionless initial user experience instead of an initial experience that is secure. Now, naturally, anytime there's a big data breach like this that impacts millions of people around um, the press loves to point all sorts of fingers and try to figure out who do we get to blame for this. And this was a particularly juicy target because the victims were people like my mom and like my daughter, little kids and grandparents and things like that. People who had really a very human technology that they were trying to take advantage of were the ones who had to pay the price here. So of course you look at cloud pets. And now cloud pets obviously holds a lion's share of the blame here, right? There was negligence on their part from a security perspective, having a database in production that anyone anywhere could access without any authentication whatsoever. That's, it's just bad. It's negligence. It's security negligence. But I don't feel like we can stop the conversation there. Uh, although we have a tendency to do that, it's easy to point at a company and point at this company and say, this is who we get to blame. This is their fault, you know, these bad people there. Um, but as uh, Kim Creighton said in her keynote actually yesterday, we have this tendency on these cultural issues to say that the enemy is out there. We tend to look outwards because it's much easier for us to do. I think we actually have to take one more step down the chain. Now nobody 
and I want to make it clear that I am not either, nobody is going to say that the MongoDB maintainers are malicious, that they are bad actors, that they, they were doing anything intentionally wrong here. We're not going to say that um, they deserve the blame for CloudPet's errors of not putting this stuff out there. But I will say that by making the decision to ship something that was insecure by default, they certainly set the stage for it. And it wasn't just cloud pets. Around the Christmas time last year, there was a whole wave of ransomware attacks um, targeting this exact issue in MongoDB. And it ended up being somewhere between 30 and 40,000 databases had their data deleted and replaced by a note telling them to deposit some Bitcoin in some random account somewhere to get their data back because they hadn't gone back and done these default configuration settings. I firmly believe that as developers, we have a certain level of responsibility that when we ship code or when we put something out there, that there is some sort of baseline. There's a baseline for performance, there's a baseline for accessibility, and yes, there's a baseline for the security of the application and the code that we produce. And that's never been more critical than it is now. Now, if you caught Mark Hinkle's keynote yesterday, he threw some really big numbers out there. 8.8 .8 million node instances, 3 billion node packages downloaded per week from the NPM registry, 4,800 published every week. ZJ got up and talked about NPM specifically. There's 156,000 package authors. And these packages are used by 9 million different users every single year. This is bigger than, as Chip said, a community that is bigger than New York City itself. It's mind blowing. Node is all over the place in the enterprise. Node is powering IoT devices. Node is embedded in NASA spacesuits. Node is literally everywhere. It's thriving and flourishing in a way that I don't think anybody could have properly anticipated a few years ago. But as it continues to thrive and as it continues to flourish in adoption, that means that there's just that many more people that are being touched by the technology that we build, that many more people that are at risk if we don't protect them. That's why yesterday was such a big deal when NPM had the announcement around the two-factor authentication that comes out with the new release. If you haven't seen this yet, absolutely check out this blog post and, and bring in the latest version and start messing around with this. Um, you now have two-factor authentication for your account, two-factor authentication for packages, for organizations, which is a huge security step forward. Um, just as importantly, they also have the ability to do read-only tokens now. It's not just published tokens. And in fact, for tokens, we can actually bind them to a specific IP address or a range of IP addresses to make sure that if a token is compromised, it doesn't matter. Like if you have a token that's used just for your continuous integration environment and it gets leaked in some way, you don't have to worry about somebody being able to do something malicious with it elsewhere because it's bound to that specific IP address. These are huge improvements. Huge improvements that help to lock down your account and keep the registry itself more secure. But what about the packages in the registry? So uh, last year, I remember watching a talk, not here, but at a different conference, uh, and it was somebody was talking about the NPM ecosystem in particular, and they pointed out that both uh, Node Security Project and Sneak, our vulnerability databases, each had around 140, 150 vulnerabilities, and when you consider how many packages are in the Node ecosystem, that's a really small number, and uh, his hypothesis was that it's because we just haven't found them yet. Uh, it turns out that he was right. In 2017, we published 526 vulnerabilities. Now, these are not all brand new things that were just written this year. Some of them have been lurking about for years, but we never found out because they've been hiding inside of GitHub issues, they've been hiding inside of PR somewhere, and they haven't been formally broadcasted to anybody, so they were just lurking about in the shadows. 526 new vulns, and they're not small, trivial vulns. 66% of these things are high severity. Only 2% of them you could call low severity vulnerabilities. Now, it's always like the rule is always that there's a, a small subset that makes up the large portion, and that's the case with these vulnerabilities. It turns out that about 80% of these new vulnerabilities that were published in 2017 are one of five different types. The most popular type being directory traversal, then resources over insecure protocol, cross-site scripting, malicious packages, and regular expression denial of service. So directory traversal is exactly what it sounds like. It's a vulnerability that lets you traverse the directory, get to some place that you're not meant to be, to be able to expose some information that you're not meant to be able to get access to. So one of the vulns we saw in 2017 was affecting the Next package, um, a framework for server-rendered React applications. So the vulnerability impacted any requests that were sent either to the underscore next or the static directories. If you looked inside of the code to see what was happening, you'd see that both routes basically just accepted the path blindly uh, and then forwarded onto a serve static method. 
Now, the serve static, again, did no validation, no verification. Uh, it just basically returned the response as it could. This meant that if you sent it a specially crafted request, something like this, for example, or if you were behind an Nginx instance using forward slashes instead, Next would happily traverse all the way back and then return and output the results of the ETC password file in plain text just for you to be able to see. All you had to do was make a single request to the URL. Now, thankfully, the fix for this was actually pretty small. All they had to do is provide some sort of validation inside of that surf static method. They added a is servable uh, URL method that just checked and confirmed that this is a URL that they want to be serving, that they should be serving. And if it's not, then they would have a 404 error instead. Now, Next, by the way, deserves mad props uh, for how quickly they responded to this, but also how thoroughly they responded to this. Um, in a situation where, as I said, many of these issues end up hiding for years in some small little commit message somewhere, they took the exact opposite approach. They had an incredibly thorough, thorough breakdown inside of their release notes. Um, they talked about, they thanked the researcher, they put clear instructions for um, how to update and how to remediate. They talked about who was impacted and how. They set up a mailing list so that there was, if there was security information, like further vulnerabilities they found, you could subscribe and get updates on that. They even had a formal audit conducted of their code to verify that there wasn't anything else lurking about that they didn't know about. So if there's like a, a sliding scale here in terms of how you respond to a security incident, and on one end is whatever is going on with Equifax right now, then next would be at the exact opposite end of this. Like the A plus all around for this. So that's directory traversal. The second, as I said, was resources over insecure protocol. This is a little bit more straightforward, um, and it's also a little less severe, I guess, in terms of the impact. It was a very common vulnerability that we saw this year, but it didn't impact a lot of large packages. Most of these other vulnerabilities hit some very big name packages. Resources over insecure protocol was found in some pretty minor ones. Um, still, what we're seeing is things like this, um, inside of a, the, a dependency making a request to pull in some sort of a resource over an HTTP protocol instead of using HTTPS. HTTP is just, it's incredibly easy to sniff, it's incredibly easy to manipulate. There's a reason why the web community as a whole has been pushing towards this idea of HTTPS everywhere, and there's just, there's no reason to be pulling resources anymore over HTTP, and it's very risky to do so. The third most common vulnerability we saw was cross-site scripting. Now, if I was going to make a guess uh, at what the vulnerability is that most people in the community are aware of, like whether or not their pre-existing security knowledge is there, it's probably cross-site scripting. This thing has been around for a long time. Every single year, it's in the top couple in terms of the frequency of the vulnerability, and that's across all sorts of languages and ecosystems. It's all over the place. Um, the idea being that if you can get a script to be injected in a page or an application, whether it's through a reflected attack, meaning it's coming from the URL and it gets reflected out onto the page somehow, or if it's stored somewhere, you get it stored into a database, and then you can have the script execute then when somebody, some action is taken, like a user logging in or something like that. Um, Cross-site scripting is um, a very common issue. One of the ones that we saw in 2017 was actually impacted an older version of Angular, um, but it's an interesting one because Angular already had stuff in place to watch for cross-site scripting. They had a whole sanitize function, ng-sanitize, and they were looking specifically for things like this, like different attributes that you could potentially use to conduct a cross-site scripting attack. But as one person pointed out, they missed an attribute here, which is the use map attribute. Is anybody familiar with the use map attribute? Okay, I got one hand going up, which is fair. Um, basically, that's something like this, where we have an image, we can define a map for the image, you know, the whole image map thing, which hopefully isn't happening super often anymore. Um, but what you could do is you could pass it like this, some malformed HTML here, and when it's actually parsed by the browser, uh, the browser tries its best to be very kind and gentle to developers if they make mistakes. So when the browser parses this, it actually creates a clickable link around the image um, that in this case just fires off an alert. But of course, if you can get an alert to run, you can be more creative and get a lot more uh, interesting things to happen in JavaScript than just that. So for their case, all it was was they had to add use map to this list of, this blacklist of attributes they were checking for. I think this highlights a couple things. First off, with cross-site scripting, it is really, really hard to cover all your bases in a blacklist. Like, Blacklisting makes sense from an Angular approach because they want this to work for as many different attributes and elements as possible. Um, 
but it's just, it's, it's incredibly difficult to anticipate all of the different attack vectors. Cross-site scripting attacks can be extremely creative and, and convoluted. If you can whitelist in any way, that's the way to do it. I think the other reason why it's interesting is because cross-site scripting is one of those vulnerabilities that you can make the argument that the end user should be doing something on their own, right? I mean, you, you as a site owner or an application owner should be using all sorts of different layers to protect yourself against these. Things like CSB, content security policy, or your friend. I mean, it's, it's not a very nice friend, but it's, it's, it's there and it's mostly there when you need it. Um, you can argue that these layers should be presented by the user and that the user should just not be, like the developer should not be trusting user input, all of these different reasons. But again, this goes back to having some sort of baseline level of security in place for the end user, some extra layer, some extra barrier of protection to keep them a little bit safer just in case they mess up, just in case they don't layer that t uh, those protections on top. So that was vulnerability number three. The fourth most common was malicious packages. This probably made more noise than any security issue in Node the entire year. Um, back in August, somebody identified that there were like 30 something different packages sitting inside the NPM registry that were malicious packages. And they were doing something called typo squatting. Uh, very simple idea. Basically, you find a popular package, something like CrossEnv was one of them. Um, and you think about how people might make a typo on this. So instead of installing npm cross m, which has a nice little hyphen, uh, if you forgot the hyphen, uh, you type too fast or you just got the name of it right, and installed this, you'd get a different package in its place, a malicious package. Now this package also brings the real cross m down. It's, it's declared as a dependency inside of the package JSON file. So as a developer, you still have access to the package you wanted to. Um, you can still play around with it and use it. Um, the package.json file itself looks actually fairly innocent. Um, they use the same description. They even are kind enough to credit the original author. I thought that was a really nice touch. To credit the original author of the legitimate package here, right? At first sniff, it doesn't look so bad. But if you look, there's this post install script that runs, this package setup.js. And if you look inside package setup.js, you find this. It sets out a malicious uh, host, npm.hacktest.net. Then it grabs the process environmental variables, stringifies it, and then sends off a request to this domain. And this happens automatically as soon as the package has been installed. Right after it's been installed, boom, it just triggers and goes. I think this is why I got so much attention because it's kind of a scary, it's a scary little attack because it's like, all right, so I made a small typo, big deal, but now I could potentially be going on for a long time here actually using the package because it's there, it's present in my uh, dependency tree, it exists. And meanwhile, every time I'm installing on any machine, the environmental variables are being leaked automatically without me having any awareness whatsoever. Now, the good news is it actually didn't impact that many people. It had been sitting inside of the uh, registry since uh, July 19th, uh, and it was caught around August 1st. Um, NPM estimates that very few people were actually impacted by most of these. These things weren't downloaded a lot. They weren't run a lot. Um, so it wasn't quite as um, widespread in terms of the impact of it as it could have been in a worst case scenario. Um, there's also work done by NPM to try and prevent this sort of thing. Um, if anybody saw CJ's talk yesterday, she was talking about how they do some similarity checking on package names when they're added to the NPM registry to verify if there's a certain level of similarity between two names, well, maybe that's a typo squatting thing. Maybe that's something we should look into. Um, so there are some checks in place, but it is a very difficult problem to solve because it preys on human error and humans are the toughest thing to fix. Like it's much easier to solve technology problems than human problems. Um, so in a scenario like this, um, it really comes down to the, a lot of it is just treating the dependencies that you're using with the respect that they deserve and taking the time to verify and validate what you're actually pulling into your application and using. And finally, the fifth most common vulnerability was the regular expression denial of service. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but this is one of my favorites. I just like the way it works. I think it's kind of fun. Um, here, let, I'll walk through an example. So uh, this is a basic regular expression. Um, here's what we're looking for. First, we have an A in place that says that the string that we're going to validate must start with the letter A. Next, we have this group, right? And what we're saying is we're going to say that the A has to be followed by either the letter B or some number of Cs. That's what the plus means. It means one or more. So in this case, A followed by B or any number of Cs. We have another plus sign right after that group, which says that that group can repeat. So we could find B, and then we could find a number of Cs, we could find a number of Cs, and then we could find B. That could continue to repeat as many times as we discover it. 
And finally, the string has to end in the letter D. So if we passed a few strings through this regular expression, these things would validate. A, B, B, D would validate because B would be found, and then that group would be found again. A, B, C, 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 D, whatever, would be found because B would be found, and then a group of Cs would be found, and then a D, and so on. If you were to time this, do just a rough approximation in terms of how long it takes to run this. And we've got a string here with quite a few Cs, but it's a valid string with a D at the end. It's pretty quick. It does not take very long for the regular expression engine to figure out that this is right. This is a valid string. If we change just one character, though, just the last final character from a D to an X, this is not a, you know, right away we can tell that this is obviously invalid, but we run this. Now it jumps up to just under two seconds to compute that this is invalid. All right, so two seconds. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's not like a deal breaker, right? So let's go ahead, and we're going to add two more Cs uh, to the string and check again. Now, again, in terms of complexity, this is not any more of a complex string from a human processing perspective. I, we know right away it's been valid. But suddenly, it jumps from that 1.88 seconds up to 7.17 seconds to figure out that something's off. Now, one last time, because it's fun in a sort of masochistic kind of way, let's pot fire in two more Cs. Again, we're not making it any more complex, just longer. Anybody go to the, uh, see the puppies at the NPM booth? That was nice. I like puppies. Puppies are cool. I've been really impressed by the weather, too, in Vancouver. I was expecting, you know, maybe some rain or something, but it's been nice to hoe off. Any good jokes? Jokes we could tell, maybe? Do you have sports in Vancouver? No? <laughs> There we go. Almost 30 seconds to figure out that this was an invalid string. And this is not a very long string, right? Now imagine what happens if we flood this thing with a whole bunch of Cs that potentially max. Imagine how long this could potentially take, right? This blocks the event loop, and this potentially brings your application to a crushing halt. So why is this happening? Well, it turns out regex engines differ, but most work very similar. They try to match the first, find the first possible way to match the first character and before moving on to the next. And if the next one doesn't match, they're going to back right up and see, OK, is there another way I can match this character that lets me continue to have a valid string? And it continues to do this. So if you get a long string and many potential different valid regex paths, what happens is it gets to the end and it keeps backtracking so often that it results in what we call catastrophic backtracking. Even something simple like this, ACCC, ACC, yeah, ACCCX, uh, right, and we pass it through this regular expression engine, looks innocent enough. But that group of Cs can be matched in any number of ways. It could be matched as one group. It could be matched as a group of two Cs followed by an individual. It could be matched as an individual followed by a group of two. It can be matched by three individuals. In fact, if you break it down for three Cs, there's 38 steps the regular expression engine must go under to, validate, to determine it's invalid. Jump it up to 14 Cs, and you see it jumps all the way to 65,553 steps for the engine to figure out that it's an invalid string. Regex engines are naively optimistic. So what you can do in a situation like this is you're watching for those competing pluses. Remember that happened because we have the plus inside the group and the plus outside the group. And it's sort of competing with each other to see who gets to claim that group. If you have things like that, that is a clear sign that you probably have a RecX denial of uh, service issue on your hands. There are some things you can do. There's a safe RecX tool um, that you could have running. Um, I will say that it doesn't catch everything. Nothing will. It's sort of like the XSS thing. It's, it'll catch some things for you, but there's still going to be some stuff that slips through. Um, but it's at least one level of protection. You can also fire up something. Uh, reg, regx101.com has a debugger where you can drop a regular expression in and then pass a bunch of strings, and it'll actually break down exactly the steps the engine goes through. If you play around with that a little bit on some of your regular expressions, just like look for invalid strings and look for big, significant jumps and steps. And that's a clue that you might have a redos issue kind of waiting and lurking about. Uh, it, the site is smart enough, if there's a redos issue, by the way, to just tell you there's going to be catastrophic backtracking. I'm not going to, you're not going to be able to bring the site down. Um, but this can cause a serious issue. I mean, Stack Overflow, I think in 2015, maybe 2016, went out for like 45, 50 minutes because somebody dumped a bunch of white space inside of one of their comment boxes, and it broke the regex and brought their system to a crash. 
Now, Redos also got a little bit of a bump, bump in terms of popularity this year uh, because of a recent issue where we had a security researcher find a bunch of Redos issues and then open a bunch of public GitHub issues on those repos directly. Um, Adam Baldwin wrote a post that sort of rallied the community to try and help out and see if we could all kind of patch as many of these as possible because this puts a lot of pressure on package owners who have a lot of stuff they got to worry about anyway um, to try and fix these things as soon as possible because as soon as an issue is public, um, we start increasing the window of exposure. There's this concept of uh, the window of exposure is how long is an application exposed to a vulnerability. And the window of exposure starts the moment the vulnerability is introduced into production. Um, and it's pretty low risk. Then once it's discovered, it starts to ramp up a little bit. And as it becomes increasingly well known and gets announced publicly, then it starts to shoot up in terms of what that window of exposure is and how high the risk is. Um, finally, the vulnerability eventually gets patched or fixed, hopefully as quickly as possible. Um, and then at some point after that, the users start to apply those patches and those fixes. Unfortunately, this doesn't take nearly, uh, takes much longer than we would hope for. Um, but basically, we want to minimize this window of exposure. And as soon as it's public, it becomes very difficult. Now, when they go public like this, sometimes it's for bad reasons. Sometimes they want the publicity, they want the attention. That's not great. Um, other times, it's because of more innocent reasons. Sometimes they don't know better, and sometimes they want to actually do the right thing and disclose it to you privately, but they don't know how. We've been running a survey um, across a bunch of different languages, but in the Java, JavaScript ecosystem, what we're seeing is that for open source uh, maintainers, 80% of them said that they have no public-facing disclosure policy in place on their repos. 80% of them, which means if there's a security issue and 80% er, of these packages, we're, the researcher's gonna have no idea who to disclose this to or how they do it. They're gonna have to do some digging first. There's an IETF proposal for a standard called security.txt, which would be used in websites similar to robots.txt, which would outline disclosure policy as well as other security uh, information that might be relevant or important to know. I would love to see every NPM package have a security.md right inside of the repo that outlines what the disclosure policy is if a security issue is found. It, it outlines what a security mailing list is where you could keep up to date. It would give all sorts of information for the actual people um, that are going to be using that dependency. And it could also even include the, their um, information about like, what to do and how they're going to alert and get the word out about a security issue um, or what they're going to do if a security issue happens. Like how are people going to be finding out? Um, because right now that's a hard problem is that communicating it to the users. 70% um, of package maintainers say that they do it through release notes. Um, sometimes, though, those release notes are really short. Sometimes it's in a release note, but it's a one-liner that says that they fixed some issue with like, regular expressions, but like, they don't go into much detail. Only 30% of authors actually deprecate the version if there's a security issue. I would love to see that number jump up. Um, and only 3% actually inform a vulnerability service like NSP or like Sneak, so that they can get the word out to the people who are using those tools to keep up to date. And on the other end, in terms of if you're using these packages, 15% of the people we've surveyed say that they don't bump their dependency versions at all. And the vast majority only do it periodically. Um, if you are using Node, if you are pulling in NPM dependencies, bumping your dependency versions is one of the low-hanging fruits that can increase the, improve the health of your application significantly. So if you're not doing this, fire up something like NSP, fire up something like Sneak, get it running on your repo. They're both free for open source um, projects. And just it'll alert you anytime there's a vulnerability, and you can keep those dependencies up to date so that there, if there is a known vulnerability, you get it fixed as soon as possible. Now, it's very easy in a security talk. <laughs> Very easy in a security talk. We're really good at it as security folks, of sort of leaving everybody in the audience feeling like crap. Like, oh man, this is, this is terrible, right? But I want to try and undo some of the, the, the FUD that I just spread um, by, by ending with a little bit of a silver lining, because I do believe that there is a silver lining here. Um, and it, it, it's, it's you, it's the community. It's been a recurring theme all the way through this entire conference, is the power of the Node ecosystem and the power of the community behind it. There were 526 volumes published in 2017. 
They were reported by 142 different people and organizations. That is a huge jump over what we had in 2016. Many more contributors. In fact, 2016, while the contributor list was um, like less than maybe 40%, 30% of this, and the bulk of it came from one or two individuals. Um, we have much more diverse group of people that are contributing to improving security this year. When we had the malicious packages issue in NPM, the response was incredibly fast. NPM found out about it August 1st. By August 2nd, they had a post out with all sorts of information. They had removed those packages um, from the actual registry. They were no longer there. People had built shell scripts to make sure that you could use a shell script that, and run and check and see if these packages were being used in your application. Um, we were alerted by somebody in the community as the, uh, like, when the NPM announcement came out. Um, and within an hour, it was inside of the vulnerability database, so you could check it. The response was incredible. Even the redos thing, we have a few of those that are unpatched, but those redos issues, quite a few of them, people jumped on very quickly. At one point, I believe one of the projects, one of the more popular projects, had several different PRs all open that all solved the regular expression issue in a different way. When there's been a security crisis, the community rallies behind it. So, you know, the state of known security, if I'm being completely honest, is not great. But it is absolutely fixable. And it's absolutely fixable because of you, because of this vibrant community that we have. You know, yesterday, Mark's keynote, he talked about this need to shift towards reliability and towards stability now in our terms of our focus for Node as, we, as it grows up and as it continues to be used in this incredible amount of different ways. And security is absolutely a part of that. We can make the Node ecosystem more secure, and we can protect our end users in the process, and there is no one that is better equipped to do that than the people in this room. Thank you.